We rolling. Okay. So, uh, I like that. We rolling. I think uh, it's time to bring our queen on. Because, uh, you know, I'm just so full. I, I could just talk. But I just want to bring the queen on so that she can give you some uh, heavy, heavy, heavy facts. Some facts that my, my, uh, my brothers and sisters will really be able to chew on because a lot of times, you know, since we're all learning, you know what I mean, we, we get a chance to share our information, but it's good when the heavy duties come around because then they get a chance to put the heavy duty stuff. And so I'm just going to make way and I'm just going to call her the queen. Let's bring her on with a round of applause. Take it off. the history of this country, the majority of us have believed that we were from Africa. I'm not going to start with that discussion tonight because most likely the reason you're here is because you already know we're not from Africa and that in fact this is our land. So beginning with that premise, whether you're more or not more, I'm going to start with what law really is. Most of us think that we go into a courtroom and understand the difference between a court and a courtroom, that uh, the people who purport to use law really use words of art to make you believe, in fact, that law is uh, on the table when you walk into a courthouse or a courtroom, when in fact that's not true. And I would like to share with you tonight, regardless of your religious persuasion, what law really is. Law all law is A-L-L -L space L-A-W. All law. All law. So for anyone who's of a Christian persuasion, don't be misled. And when you hear the term all law, all law is God, all right? That is also what we would say in lawful terms, a misnomer. All law is not God. God has no capacity and no standing to all law. Because God means governmental ordinance departments. There is no comparison. Now, who can use law? Law can only be used by people who are in their sovereign capacity. And I was, as I will share with you tonight, the majority of the people in the world, and I'm not going to get into all of the details about that, but the majority of the people in the world, 99% of them live in slavery today. So in 1863, via the Emancipation Proclamation, and I challenge you to go look in a law dictionary and look up the definition of emancipation and proclamation and you will see that a proclamation is not a law. A proclamation is a public announcement by elected officials. It is not a law. So the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 did not set any slaves free. What it did was standardize slavery the United States being the model for the standardization of slavery that all of the other nations around the world as they reduced their people from their sovereign capacity and forced them to join nation states. Then they were able to 
issue statute, codes, ordinances, resolutions on them. And a statute, as in a state statute of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, is not a law. It is corporate policy of the corporation that calls itself the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Incorporated. All right? Now, a code is not a law. The United States codes, the code of the laws of the United States of America that are used in federal court and the Supreme Court are not law. They are what they say they are. They are codes, ordinances, and resolutions of a municipality of the city of Philadelphia, which is a private, nonprofit corporation that calls itself the city of Philadelphia, an ordinance and a resolution, as in parking ordinances, they are not law. They are what they say they are. They are ordinances and they are resolutions. All right? And the reason they are not law is because the only people who can issue law are people who are acting in their sovereign capacity. And the people who sit in these seats as elected officials are not, in fact, in their sovereign capacity. They are in a corporate ward status, meaning that they are wards of the state. They are members of the corporation, which is a nonprofit, that calls itself the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And as long as they have a birth certificate on record with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, with that birth certificate being a contract, a birth certificate is a contract, and as long as you have a contract with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Incorporated, you belong to them, and that's what slavery really is. All right? So who can use law? If you are a member of a corporate ward state, if you are a member of a corporate ward nation that calls itself the United States of America, you are a citizen. Look in the law dictionary and look up the definition of citizen. A citizen is not a sovereign. A resident is not a sovereign. Therefore, if you use an address, which is a fictitious number associated with a designation issued by a corporate ward, right? Then you become under the jurisdiction of those people who are also corporate wards but who are also slaveholders, all right? So if you are operating in that capacity, law does not apply to you. If you are a resident of the city of Philadelphia, which is a private, nonprofit corporation, and you say you are a resident of the city of Philadelphia, then the ordinances and the resolutions of that private, nonprofit corporation apply to you. If you are a citizen of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Incorporated, which is a private nonprofit corporation, then the statutes of that nonprofit corporation apply to you. If you are a citizen of the United States of America, which is a private nonprofit corporation, then the code of the laws, right, apply to you. But if you are a sovereign of the Moorish Empire, those ordinances, those resolutions, those codes, those statutes do not apply to you because you are not a member of the corporate ward state. It's as simple as that. And they understand the difference. This is why on their documents they use words of art. They use the word label, they use the word person, they use the word address, all of these things that place you in their jurisdiction and you unknowingly fill out forms every day and every time you fill out a form, you enter into a contract. I don't care what kind of form it is, it's a contract. A driver's license application is a contract. A social security application is a contract. When you call up the telephone company and you make a verbal contract over the telephone, this is why they can bill you. When you sign a deed, it is a contract. When you fill out a voter registration form, it is a contract. Does everybody understand that? Don't ever think. Every, anything that you put your signature on becomes a contract. All right? Now, the fact that you are not in your sovereign status means that you make a contract as a minor. They don't care. They know you are a minor because and, and 
to be other than a minor, you have to be in your proper person at law. And how we write that is this. Can I have a That's working. Can, can you bear with me for a minute and let me put this on because uh, I can't. Can y'all see that? Impropria persona. Impropria persona. When you are in your corporate ward status, you look like this to the court. Pro se. Pro se meaning they get you in the court and they bring someone in called a... Got that? Pro se cuter. A prosecutor because you're in a corporate board status. Now, if you're in proper persona, say in their criminal allegations, the prosecutor cannot come into the courtroom and say anything to you because you're not in pro se status. Makes sense, right? The issues of law, the issues of law are threefold. The issues of law are status, jurisdiction, and adjudication. The first thing that happens when you walk into a courtroom in your corporate ward status is that they already make the assumption that you are a ward of the state and that you don't know any better. So they immediately start adjudicating you. As the first thing that happens when we walk into a courtroom is that we place our status on the record. On the record. We come in with our flag. We come in with our treaty. We come in with the Constitution. We sign with them. And understanding that the Constitution is a contract. It's a contract between who? It's a contract between the United States Republic and the United States of America. But there are certain clauses in that contract that apply to Moors, which takes us back to the Treaty of 1787. But that contract between the United States and the United States of America does not apply to us other than that part that discusses the treaty. So it's not relevant for us to go into any courtroom and argue about their ordinances, their codes, their statutes. The only thing we're in there to talk about is, have we violated the treaty? Have we violated that part, which is Article 6 of the Constitution, that applies to us? That's the only question in the courtroom. Because the status of the individuals looks like this. You and the judge, there's nobody else that you need to discuss anything with in the courtroom besides the judge. The prosecutor is invisible to you. Now, what do you have to say to that judge? My honor, not your honor. What is your status? What is your name? What is your nationality? All right? And do not let them get away with saying, I am a U.S. citizen. Uh -uh. You cannot be a citizen and sit a bench. You cannot be a member of the Bar Association, which is a private, nonprofit corporation that issues registration numbers to its members who do not have a license to practice law in any state. Because in order to have a license to practice law, you must have your appropriate proper person and in order to be appropriate persona in this country 
whether that be North America, Central America, or South America, you must be a Moor. If they want to be sovereign, they've got to go home. They cannot be sovereign here. All right? The next issue of law is jurisdiction. Now let me stick with status. What is the status of the prosecutor? What is the status of the district attorney? What is the status of Lynn Abraham? Does anybody in this room know her nationality? I don't. That's an important question to ask her if she serves me with any papers. Who are you? Where is your license to practice law? Where is your proof of naturalization in my land? Who gave you the authority to be here? Right? Who issued you authority to act in any capacity to file any complaint or any charges against anyone? That's the question. And I say to you, she can't answer those questions. Right? So then, if you go into a courtroom and nobody else has the status to be there, automatically challenge the jurisdiction of the court. There's nothing else that you need to say. There's nothing else to be said. Stand mute. Let them proceed because guess what? They cannot proceed. You have a question. How do we make them honor that information that you just passed on to us? In the courtroom, as I have learned because I've spent a lot of time there, right, there is a language of silence. After you've said what you need to say, don't say any more. They will do the rest when you stand on your square. That's all you need to do. There's no need to stand there and argue with the judge and judge, and trust me, I've done that. <laughs> All right? And once you say what you need to say, they know everything else to do. But understand, they do not want you exposing the truth to their corporate wards because every slave that you take out of their corporation, they lose money. This is making business. So don't go into the courtroom trying to expose the fraud. That's not your job. That's not why you're there. There's another venue for that. In that courtroom, because understand it's not court, because it's not law. And I'm going to get into that in a few minutes. So don't try to challenge them on the law. They already know that. They already know they don't have the proper status. They already know they're operating in your land fraudulently. All right? Just say what you have to say and back off. They will give you the window. And it's up to you, if you are educated enough about the law, you'll see the window, you'll recognize it, and then you'll be able to walk through it and walk out the door. But if you're not conscious, when they open the window for you, I'll give you an example. As I gave in class just a few nights ago, I uh, went into the courtroom and the judge has papers there in front of me and he's just arguing with me, young lady, you'd better come back here. I'm going to send all these officers I have at my disposal with guns to hunt you down and bring you... And he's just running his mouth. And the prosecutor slides me the paper to sign. And the, it was blank. Do you understand? Do you understand? Yes, so I signed the paper because I know how to sign contracts and not be obligated to them. Right? So I did that, signed the blank piece of paper. They took a copy, I took a copy, and I left. And I never heard from them again. But if I had stood there as I shared with class, and I have done this, this paper is blank, and I'm not signing it, and, right? So, all I had to do was come into the courtroom and say what I had to say. Now, I know how to present myself in the courtroom, Islam, right? And see the window and walk out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, the next issue at law is jurisdiction. We already know they don't have the status. Now, do they have the jurisdiction? The answer is no. Because in order to have jurisdiction, you must first prove status. Everybody in the courtroom must have status on the record. Why is that so important? Because unless their status is on the record, what, what country do you represent? Says what law you're here to 
um, get justice on, right? Now, if, if you have not clarified the status for the record, you can't bring your law into the court. So there can be no court. So status is very important. And so it, if, if you're more, and let's say somebody else is Manchurian, and I'll get to that in a minute, when you have two people of different standings in the courtroom, you have to decide what law applies. Is there a treaty between the two? Do they have a constitution? Do they have any other trade agreement or contract that binds them and obligates the parties? That's the question. All right? So, if you walk into the courtroom and they immediately start adjudicating, you have no idea what law they're using. And I guarantee you, because status has not been established for the record, they're not using any law that applies to you. And they're not using any law that applies to them. They're simply using corporate policy, which is discretionary. If they like you today, they'll let you off. If they don't like you tomorrow, they'll give you some time or a fine. Okay? So status and then jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is going to determine what area, what geographical area encompasses the authority that that judge or that court has. All right? So if you're in a municipal court or a court of common pleas, don't go in there talking about the Constitution because they don't have jurisdiction to discuss the Constitution with you. Do not go into a state court discussing the Constitution unless it's the state's Constitution. Because the United States is the Constitution, they have no jurisdiction over. But they won't tell you that. They'll dismiss the case. Different jurisdictions. And don't go into federal court talking about city ordinances. You understand the difference? Okay. Jurisdiction. Then adjudication. Once you get to the part about adjudication, you have to ask the question, do you understand the law that applies to you, that applies to this matter? Because there's two types of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction over the matter and jurisdiction over the person. All right? Does the court have both? They must have both in order to proceed. They don't tell you these things, but this is very important. So if the court has gotten to the point of adjudication, all right, which... For me, I don't have that problem. But once the court gets to the point of adjudication, then they're ready to start prosecuting. They're ready to find you guilty of something, some kind of way. And the reason for that is because it's a business. And once you enter there and they seize jurisdiction over you, they adjudicate for the sole purpose of getting some money. That's that. Because and, and to be other than a minor, you have to be in your proper person at law. And how we write that is this. Can I have a That's working. Can, can you bear with me for a minute and let me put this on because uh, I can't. Can y'all see that? Impropria persona. Impropria persona. When you are in your corporate ward status, you look like this to the court. Pro se. Pro se meaning they get you in the court and they bring someone in called a... Got that? Pro se cuter, a prosecutor, because you're in a corporate board status. Now, if you're in propria persona, say in their criminal allegations, the prosecutor cannot come into the courtroom and say anything to you because you're not in pro se status. Makes sense, right? The issues of law, the issues of law are threefold. The issues of law are status, jurisdiction, and adjudication. The first thing that happens when you walk into a courtroom in your corporate ward status is that they already make the assumption that you are a ward of the state and that you don't know any better. So they immediately start adjudicating you. As Moors, the first thing that happens when we walk into a courtroom is that we place our status on the record. 
on the record we come in with our flag we come in with our treaty we come in with the constitution we sign with them and understanding that the constitution is a contract it's a contract between who it's a contract between the united states republic and the united states of america but there are certain clauses in that contract that apply to moors which takes us back to the treaty of 1787 but that contract between the united states and the united states of america does not apply to us other than that part that discusses the treaty so it's not relevant for us to go into any courtroom and argue about their ordinances their codes their statutes the only thing we're in there to talk about is have we violated the treaty have we violated that part which is article six of the constitution that applies to us that's the only question in the courtroom because the status of the individuals looks like this You and the judge. There's nobody else that you need to discuss anything with in the courtroom besides the judge. The prosecutor is invisible to you. Now, what do you have to say to that judge? My honor, not your honor. What is your status? What is your name? What is your nationality? All right? And do not let them get away with saying, I am a U.S. citizen. Uh -uh. You cannot be a citizen and sit a bench. You cannot be a member of the Bar Association, which is a private, nonprofit corporation that issues registration numbers to its members who do not have a license to practice law in any state. Because in order to have a license to practice law, you must have your appropriate proper person and in order to be in appropriate persona in this country whether that be north america central america or south america you must be a more if they want to be sovereign they've got to go home they cannot be sovereign here all right the next issue of law is jurisdiction now let me stick with status what is the status of the prosecutor what is the status of the district attorney what is the status of Lynn Abraham does anybody in this room know her nationality I don't that's an important question to ask her if she serves me with any papers well, who are you where is your license to practice law where is your proof of naturalization in my land who gave you the authority to be here right who issued you authority to act in any capacity to file any complaint or any charges against anyone that's the question and I say to you she can't answer those questions right so then if you go up into a courtroom and nobody else has the status to be there automatically challenge the jurisdiction of the court there's nothing else that you need to say there's nothing else to be said. Stand mute. Let them proceed because guess what? They cannot proceed. You have a question. How do we make them honor that information that you just passed on to us? In the courtroom, as I have learned because I've spent a lot of time there, right, there is a language of silence. After you've said what you need to say, don't say any more. They will do the rest when you stand on your square. That's all you need to do. There's no need to stand there and argue with the judge and judge, and trust me, I've done that. <laughs> all right? 
And once you say what you need to say, they know everything else to do, but understand. They do not want you exposing the truth to their corporate wards because every slave that you take out of their corporation, they lose money. This is a money-making business. So don't go into the courtroom trying to expose the fraud. That's not your job. That's not why you're there. There's another venue for that. In that courtroom, because understand it's not court, because it's not law, and I'm going to get into that in a few minutes. So don't try to challenge them on the law. They already know that. They already know they don't have the proper status. They already know they're operating in your land fraudulently. All right? Just say what you have to say and back off. They will give you the window. And it's up to you. If you are educated enough about the law, you'll see the window, you'll recognize it, and then you'll be able to walk through it and walk out the door. But if you're not conscious, when they open the window for you, I'll give you an example. As I gave in class just a few nights ago, I uh, went into the courtroom and the judge has papers there in front of me and he's just arguing with me, young lady, you'd better come back here. I'm going to send all these officers I have at my disposal with guns to hunt you down and bring you. And he's just running his mouth. And the prosecutor slides me the paper to sign and the, it was blank. Do you understand? Do you understand? Yes, so. I signed the paper because I know how to sign contracts and not be obligated to them, right? So I did that, signed the blank piece of paper, they took a copy, I took a copy and I left and I never heard from them again. But if I had stood there, as I shared with class, and I have done this, this paper is blank and I'm not signing it, and, right? So. All I had to do was come into the courtroom and say what I had to say. Now, I know how to present myself in the courtroom, Islam, right? And see the window and walk out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, the next issue at law is jurisdiction. We already know they don't have the status. Now, do they have the jurisdiction? The answer is no. Because in order to have jurisdiction, you must first prove status. Everybody in the courtroom must have status on the record. Why is that so important? Because unless their status is on the record, what, what country do you represent? Says what law you're here to um, get justice on, right? Now, if, if you have not clarified the status for the record, you can't status for the record, you can't bring your law into the court. So there can be no court. So status is very important. And so it, if, if you're more, and let's say somebody else is Manchurian, and I'll get to that in a minute. When you have two people of different standings in the courtroom, you have to decide what law applies. Is there a treaty between the two? Do they have a constitution? Do they have any other trade agreement or contract that binds them and obligates the parties? That's the question. All right? So, if you walk into the courtroom and they immediately start adjudicating, you have no idea what law they're using. And I guarantee you, because status has not been established for the record, they're not using any law that applies to you. And they're not using any law that applies to them. They're simply using corporate policy, which is discretionary. If they like you today, they'll let you off. If they don't like you tomorrow, they'll give you some time or a fine. Okay? So status and then jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is going to determine what area, what geographical area encompasses the authority that that judge or that court has. All right? So if you're in a municipal court or a court of common pleas, don't go in there talking about the Constitution because they don't have jurisdiction to discuss the Constitution with you. Do not go into a state court discussing the Constitution unless it's the state's Constitution. Because the United States is the Constitution, they have no jurisdiction over, but they won't tell you that. They'll dismiss the case. Different jurisdictions. And don't go into federal court talking about city ordinances. You understand the difference? Okay. Jurisdiction. Then adjudication. Once you get to the part about adjudication, you have to ask the question, do you understand the law that applies to you, that applies to this matter? Because there's two types of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction over the matter and jurisdiction over the person. All right? Does the court have both? They must have both in order to proceed. They don't tell you these things, but this is very important. So if the court has gotten to the point of adjudication, all right, which... For me, I don't have that problem. But 
Once the court gets to the point of adjudication, then they're ready to start prosecuting. They're ready to find you guilty of something, some kind of way. And the reason for that is because it's a business. And once you enter there and they seize jurisdiction over you, they adjudicate for the sole purpose of getting some money. That's, that's the bottom line. They don't care about you, whether you're innocent or whether you're guilty, none of that. How much money are they going to get out of this? And their, and their little club that they have called the Bar Association, their members have to be fed. So they want to make sure that this one gets fed and that one gets fed. And that's fine because that's their corporate thing. That's the way they make money. And if they're going to make money being deceitful and all that, that's the karmic baggage they've got to carry. But you don't want to be a participant to it. That's all. Okay. Color of law. Colorable color means something that pretends to be something that it's not. Colorable court, colorable money, colorable law, colorable people, any people who call themselves colored, Negro, African American, Indian, Puerto Rican, Chinese, Australian, all of these are colorable labels, but these people for the most part around the world don't even know this. But because they call themselves Chinese, as I was getting ready to say to you, they are part of a corporate nation state as well because the country of China is Manchuria. The nation state, the corporate ward nation state is China. That is not the country or the sovereignty of the people. The people are Manchurian. All right? You understand? Say anybody who wants to call themselves Puerto Rican. Puerto Rico is a corporate nation state. It is a private, non-profit corporation that has a charter issued by the Moors where they have the, the authority to conduct commerce and trade on the island of Borincano. Borinqua, right? Borinqua. That's the name of the people. Borincano is the name of the island. Puerto Rico is the private nonprofit corporation that has the charter to operate within the geographical boundaries of Borincano. Most Puerto Ricans don't even know that. I go around telling people all the time, you're not this, you're not that. This is who you really are because people have grown, into, grown up into slavery for generation after generation in all these corporate nation states who belong to the United Nations, which is a private nonprofit corporation trade association for nation state corporations. Got it? In order to belong to the United Nations, you have to be a corporate ward state, nation state. Otherwise, they don't want you. And they will go to war against a country and take the people out of their sovereign capacity and say they're setting up democracy all around the world so that they can take people out of their sovereign capacity and take them away from the law and impose corporate statute on them. And that's exactly what they do. All right? Now, color of law is in full swing all around the world. All around the world. And they have a clique where they're all intermingled and they all agree to participate together in this game. Right? Now, it doesn't matter where you go. Just like most people think you need a passport to travel from company to company to company that are called nation states. So you do need a passport if you call yourself black or African American or a U.S. citizen or any of those things. Yes, you need a passport to travel from one corporate nation state to another. But when you're traveling from one country to another, you do not need a passport. And those countries will tell you you don't. Depends on what you call yourself. You understand? Okay. Why do we have colorable law and colorable courts? During the Civil War, the Moors went to war against each other. Now, we destroyed ourselves in this. The, the Europeans did not come here and bring us down. We did that from inside, and they capitalized on the carnage. Do you understand? All of these buildings all around here, as I told in class last night, they're ours, they belong to us. They're ancient, these buildings. There's a whole city underneath this city. They went and burned all the major cities, the major energy centers on this globe we called an Earth. Our ancestors set up these energy centers that we call Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Atlanta, Detroit, right? Chicago, Miami, Phoenix, Los Angeles. They are energy centers. They're not where they are in huge, large cities just because of some coincidence. There's energy and power in these places, London. 
Rio de Janeiro. All right? And, and by the way, we're going to spell it like this, Rio de. Day, which is a normal title of the Moors, Rio de Janeiro. You understand? This thing is worldwide. This flag that we carry with the red flag, with the five-pointed green star, with the pointing up, all right, is a worldwide flag. It's recognized all around the world, all right? So the reason we have colorable courts and colorable law is because during the Civil War, when the Moors warred against each other, there were those who agreed to participate in the game called the corporate ward game. And there were many who made a lot of money. They got a commission on everybody they got to sign a birth certificate because the birth certificate is a contract that puts you in slavery. And they got money. William Penn got very rich, all right? All the Quakers got very rich. All the abolitionists got very rich on this Civil War ward state game. Robert Morris and a lot of these buildings that are named after these people in downtown Philadelphia became multimillionaires, and their ancestors are still wealthy today over the corporate ward game. All right? Now, the reason that we have to have colorable law and colorable courts is because so many of us agree to be slaves. We don't need colorable courts and colorable law otherwise. But the people who agree to be bound by the 14th Amendment, which covers civil rights, which covers Negroes and African Americans and Jews and Hispanics and Indians and all these people like that, if you agree to call yourself that, they have to create a statute that applies to you because law doesn't apply to you. So it's not their fault. It's the fault of the people who agree to be outside of their sovereign capacity. Okay? And now, if you walk in and you want to reestablish it, they're at odds because they're not, they're not accustomed to people walking in who are conscious and sovereign. There's, hey, you can't separate the two when you walk into a courtroom. And when I say you walk in on your square, I don't mean standing with your feet at a right angle. All right? I mean the not to be deterred when you know you're in the fight and you have law on your side. Do not back down. But you do not have to be belligerent. Trust me, I've been there. Don't do that. Okay? Now, the law of the land. The law of the land as it applies to the United States of America and the United States is their constitution. The law of the land which supersedes that, which if you go and read the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution, you will see that the treaty, in particular the Treaty of 1787, which was last signed, which was last signed and ratified in 1986, all right, it's re-signed every 50 years, that it's the treaty that is the actual law of the land. Now, that being the case, how do we make that treaty work for us? We always say they are not honoring the treaty. This is the oldest treaty in the world. Did y'all know that? And it's the only unbroken and longest standing treaty in the world. Did y'all know that? Now, that treaty protects us. You need to go get a copy of it, the Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1787, all right? Signed by the Emperor of Morocco. Actually, he signed it in the year, in the month of Ramadan, in the year 12, 1201. All right, which translates into the Gregorian calendar year of 1787 because they added 586 years to our calendar. All right, so in terms of using the law of the land and when you express these things to them, you don't even have to uh, go into a lot of detail about it because those who rule and those in government and those who sit on those judicial benches know what this doctrine is and they adhere to it. But the problem is there's not enough of us standing up defending it. Okay? How to correct the issue. The people must, must be in their proper person. The people must act in their sovereign capacity. As the brother said earlier, how do you behave as a sovereign? How do you behave as a sovereign? You behave as a sovereign by not getting so upset and ranting and raving and causing a scene. There's no need to do any of that. As I said in the courtroom, as in with law enforcement and any of that, there's a language of silence. Just like the mummers who march down Broad Street every New Year's and they're playing it up and playing it up. What does mummery mean? Silent mockery. Who are they mocking? 
all right? But they understand the language of silence and they, and they deal in it all the time with their secret signs and symbols. But don't be angry with them for using these things. Why not? We taught it to them. Okay? Don't be angry with them because they have gotten out of control with the power that we gave them. We created these people. We can't now, now turn around and say, now we don't want you, now, you know, go off someplace else and this and that. And if you know the history, you know that the Moors, what the Moors did to these people when they were first created. The Moors considered them subhuman. They couldn't speak Latin, which is our original language. They couldn't go to school. They couldn't own land. They couldn't vote. They were totally disenfranchised. And this is why the Moors commissioned, ha, um, commissioned Benjamin Bay, who you know as Benjamin Banneker, who is also Benjamin Franklin, by the way, okay, to teach these people the science of government. He did that for a select few. Unfortunately, it couldn't go and spread as widely as it should have been. Now we have a situation on our hands where we as Moors refuse to be who we are. In the civil rights movement, there were those who led it who were paid to get us off our square, and we agreed to be there. We agreed to be called black, and we're proud of it, remember? Now, who could tell us any different? Now, the Europeans have a dilemma because they've lied to us so much and we have forgotten so much that if they stand up to tell us the truth, would we believe them? The majority of the people who call themselves African American, right now, if you tell them they're not from Africa, they'll give you hell. Right. Am I right? right? Yes, we are. <laughs> now, can you imagine they're getting, you're getting that feedback from them? Can you imagine what they would say to a European who now try to tell them they're not from Africa? You understand? Now you've got Bill Gates who's given a billion dollars to the United Negro College Fund, you know, to keep more Negroes out of their sovereign capacity and they jump right into the boat, right? Play it up to the hilt. Oh, what a great thing he's done. You know, they love him to death. Now if the Moors try to stand up and say who the man really is, you got all these black people who are going to criticize you. Leave the man alone, they'll say. All right? But we know the truth. So we correct the issue only by standing on our square, whether we're Moors or whether we're not. All right? Now, let's talk about what law really is. Law is based upon the science, the science of astrology, astrologic. Don't let anybody ever tell you that astrology is for entertainment purposes. It is the science that rules. It is the science that governs. As I said to you, what all law is, all law. All law. Do we praise all law? Absolutely. Do we praise Christ? Absolutely, because what, what, not who. What is Christ? Christ is the great I am. And if you know what Islam means, let me tell you this. I, self, law, am, master. I am the master of my own fate. I am all law. All right? When you walk into the courtroom and you know these things, trust me, you get a different result. When they ask you your name, you never say, my name is. That's a label. What do you say? I am. I am. You never swear on the Bible. You affirm. You affirm on the Bible. And as Sister Thanai here said to me, oh, they try to trick you. They'll say, do you swear or affirm? No. You just say, I affirm. Because what? I am. And who you are. And that's your status. And nobody can compete with that. Nobody can take that from you. And no matter what paperwork you submit to a court, what is the most important thing is when you walk into a courtroom and you speak the law. And when you speak the law in a courtroom, guess what? You speak it into existence. Because a thought is an activity. It's real. 
It may not be something you can touch, but as soon as that thought transpires into a word, it becomes a spell. That's why they call it spelling. You get it? Now, law is based upon the zodiac. Now, when you walk into a courtroom, there's all kinds of things going on. There's sacred geometry going on in the courtroom. In fact, the courtroom is set up according to sacred geometry. All right? And here's what happens when you're in there. The judge is at the top of the triangle. Got it? When you walk in there, and as I had shared in another class, to deal with marriage, it's the same thing. And I'm going to talk about that also in a minute. You walk in there, and when you appear, never tell the court that you are appearing. Look in the law dictionary and find out the definition of appear. Never do that. You go into the courtroom and you make a what? A special appearance. Not general. That will get you in trouble every time if you appear in a courtroom. And all of these little nuances, they know these things. And they are put there to trap you who don't know. So when you walk in there and you're on your square, being on your square means to know these things and not to walk in the courtroom uncomfortable. Because when you know them, you have no reason not to come to court, do you? You want to be there because you want to make a special appearance to challenge the jurisdiction of the court. Why? Because of the lack of status. And once jurisdiction is challenged, it must be proven for the record. It must be proven for the record before the court can proceed. Do you understand? The judge must come with his nationality papers. He must come with the flag of the country not the nation state that he represents. That United States flag with the 50 stars, which now should be 48, because there are only 48 states. Did y'all know that? Two of them dropped out, Hawaii and Alaska, are no, more, are no longer states. Did y'all know that? They're no longer states. They're no longer states. The treaty was up, they got out. All right? I'm kind of going through a lot of things right now, and, okay. All right. The law is used by people in their proper person. When you walk into the courtroom, you should always have your paperwork precede you. Don't walk in there without first having submitted some document to the court to let them know that, yes, I'm coming. And, and look in the law dictionary and look up the definition of come. It's different than appear. Now you can come to the courtroom, all right, and make a special appearance. You understand? Never, never, they, you get the subpoena, whatever it is in the newspaper, and don't believe all this other stuff where they tell you, don't go to court if you get these papers, because they will put a manhunt out for you, and you do not need that. And there's no reason for you not to go you should go. You should go, and the more of us that do go and challenge the jurisdiction and let them see, we're not scared because we're standing on the square. They will stop calling you <laughs> to court, all right? Because the people who operate in their proper person, and the more and more of us that go in there operating in our proper person, they're going to begin to see the game is up, the secret's out. We can't do this anymore, all right? Justice died upon the cross. What does that mean? I'm no artist.
that is the cardinal points of the zodiac. Cardinal, as in Catholic Church, cardinal. They are your deacons of the zodiac. Deacons, as in the Christian Church. They are your cardinal points. And they apply to everything you do. Who you are, your character, everything that surrounds you, your environment, the country where you live, everything is affected by the different signs of the zodiac. When justice died on the cross, here's what happened. That's our solar system, and that's the sun in the middle. And that's Earth, the third rock from the sun, which is its planetary position. That's not its name. And its planetary position will be changing, is changing every day, and it's speeding up and getting closer and closer to the sun until it will occupy the second position, rock from the sun. This is the natural life cycle of a planet. And all the planets are coming in, and then more planets are being created out further beyond Pluto. So what they call the greenhouse effect is the natural heating up of the planet. And all those who cannot meet the heat requirement as the planet heats up will be eliminated from the planet. This is the science of the zodiac. Now, just like we have the zodiac, which I just showed you, based upon what is called the geocentric form of astrology. Geocentric because it's centered based on the Earth as its center point. Then there's the heliocentric form of astrology, which is based upon the sun being the center. Sun is helio, Earth is geo. Everybody understand that? Now, just like we have our signs applied to the earth here, the sun also has its center point here. Everybody understand that? Does everybody understand that our entire solar system is spinning around the Milky Way? The earth spins on its axis, the moon spins on, right, spins around, well, let me back up. The moon doesn't spin around the earth like they told you, but the moon does have a cycle. Now. The earth spins on its axis and the earth spins around the sun. The sun spins on its axis and this entire solar system spins around the Milky Way. Everybody understand that? That's, that's basic, right? Very basic. Now, check this out. It takes the sun 26,000 years to make one revolution around the Milky Way. Everybody understand that? This, I'm not, this is uh, science here. I'm not trying to make up stuff just to, just to lie to you, okay? And all of this, believe it or not, is relative to law. That's why I'm explaining it to you, all right? And we talk, the subject is justice died upon the cross. So I'm coming back to that, but I have to give you this information first so you'll understand. 26,000 years for the sun to make one journey around the Milky Way. All right? If we divide that by 12, why are we dividing it by 12? There are 12 signs of the zodiac. All right? Now, if we divide it by 12, this is the number. Two thousand one hundred sixty six years. So our solar system spins two thousand one hundred and sixty six years in one sign. We just left the age of Pisces. An age is equal to two thousand one hundred and sixty six years. Now you've heard the term an age. 
but nobody ever thought about it. We say for ages. What's an age equal to? Mathematically, it's equal to 2,166 years. Got it? Now, we just entered the age of Aquarius. All right, 2,166 is represented here. See that? So each one, right, has a time frame of 2,166. Everybody understand that? Here's what happens. I don't need to write all of them, right? You all understand the point. We just left the age of Pisces, which was, uh, or an eon. An age and an eon are equal to 2,166 years. Now, we just left the age of Pisces, which is represented by what we know as Jesus. This is why Jesus is represented by the sign of the fish. It's over. The age of Pisces is over, all right? Not to come around again until we go through all of the other 11 signs of the zodiac. Now we're in the age of Aquarius. What does that mean? Justice, and any Mason will tell you if he can unravel the allegory, is Jesus. Jesus was born. Why? Because what's the opposite of, of Pisces? Jesus was born of a virgin mother. Virgo is the virgin. Virgo is the virgin, right? Who in here is Virgo? Anybody? Virgo is the virgin, right? Okay. So Jesus was born of the virgin mother, Virgo. Got it? All of this stuff in the Bible, because understand that the Bible is not a religious book. The Quran is not a religious book. They are science books. Biblios Heliotech is the Bible. It's the full Latin name of the Bible. It is the science. It's an elementary science where Moors are concerned. It's the science of the study of the cycle of the sun. Helio meaning study, meaning sun. Biblios meaning record of. Y'all understand? The Quran, Quran, chronology, chronology, maxima, the great chronology. The Quran is the great chronology of the science and the study of the asteroid, of the astral plane. You understand? Okay, so justice died on the cross. Here's what happened. Those that we call Europeans or Albions, Europeans or Albions ruled during the age of Pisces. So when we say the time is up, we're not just, just saying this by conjecture. We're saying this because the time, the 2,166 years that they had, is over. I'm not saying this because I have any bias against them or any of that. This is the science of it, and they know it. The problem is, our people are not ready for it. <laughs> how, how can justice return under the age of Aquarius if we're not ready? The age of Aquarius demands information. It is the technology age Aquarius is. Aquarius demands answers. Our youth demand answers. They demand the truth. They demand this truth because they cannot proceed and lead the world without this knowledge. They cannot do it. They cannot do this without the understanding of the zodiac, which is this. Zodiacus is the ancient name of the term zodiac. Zodiacus implies the first woman. Who is this? Womb man. We are man with a womb. That's who we are. No spirit can enter this plane without the agreement of a womb man. Period. 
We are the vehicle. We have a covenant with the cosmos where we agree to bring those spirits, which we call monads, from the astral plane and summon them to this physical plane. And it is only through the womb man that they can leave, exit, and then reposition themselves in another plane. All of this revel relevant to all law. Now, this is why when the brother talked about getting our land back, I know this issue very well. I fight this fight every day on top of all my other duties and responsibilities and everything else that I do. So when we talk about justice returns under the age of Aquarius, this is why when we walk into a courtroom and we understand that the court, as I explained to a class just recently, a court is also a corporation. They don't hide that from you. They put it right on the seal, right behind the judge. And they tell you that this court was incorporated in 1878, whatever it is. This court was incorporated, and, and what words do they use? Founded. So when you see the word founded, and you see the word established in, it already tells you that they're a corporation. Understand? And anybody who owns a corporation does what? Own a slave, because a corporation is a slave holder. Understand? Now, let's talk about the issues that come up in court. How am I with time, uh, Noah? All right. <laughs> the point I want to make real quick um, relative to going to court and getting land back and all these issues and all these injustices that have been done to us. When we uh, participate in organizations that take us off our square, that adds to the chaos and the confusion. So it's better not to join anything at all and just be yourself if you're not going to be a more, but if you, even if you're going to be a more, understand that sovereignty is an individual thing. Don't go into court talking about, I belong to such and such organization. And be clear about that, because as soon as you say an association, an organization, a business, a firm, a corporate, you're talking about slavery. And they love that language, because you're putting yourself right in their jurisdiction as soon as you say it. But you go in there and say, I am. Well, what organization do you belong to? Well, none. They do not know how to deal with you. But as soon as you say corporation, because they're a corporation and they speak the corporate language and they have corporate policy, they'll love you to say that. So the first thing they're going to do is, hmm, how are we going to get some money? All right? Because that's, that's the name of the game, money. Now, let's talk about who they are, why they exist, these courts. First of all, we know they're not really courts. We know they're colorable. They know they're colorable. They have to be colorable because they're dealing with colorable people, right? If we choose not to be colorable, we don't belong in there. So the court is this. Just like the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, just like the Bar Association, just like the United States of America, they are this. They are a private nonprofit corporation. If you get some mail that belongs to me, do you go and show up and say you're me? No. You, you can't do that. So if a private nonprofit corporation sends you a document and you have no contract with them, why should you go up and debate the contract? Because if you don't have a contract, right? If you don't have a contract, you don't have a contract. It's as simple as that. You don't need to go there and say all that. Just say, because here's my status and this and that and the other, right? Don't go in there trying to debate whether you owe money on the contract or not. Um, the bill was too high and all that. And I'm not saying that because of what you said. Un understand that. If you don't have the contract, why are you discussing the bill? It doesn't make sense, does it? First, you have to have a contract. So the first thing you need to understand when you walk in there, I don't care what the issue is. Here's the question. And, and I write things down, specific things I write down, because when I write them down, I'm spelling, understand? Do we have a contract? 
Mm. If I rescind my birth certificate, do I agree to belong to the corporate ward state that calls itself the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which is a private nonprofit corporation? If I don't have a birth certificate with you, what agreement do we have that you should summon me to answer anything? Right? If I don't have an agreement with the parking authority, which I don't, do they have the right to send me a bill saying that I owe them for a parking ticket? It is, it's ludicrous. Now, the thing to say is, if, if you don't have the contract, you have certain rights. And you need to exercise those rights. And there are codes even that are there, and laws that are there to protect you if you don't have a contract with somebody and they're trying to make you adhere to a contract. I don't care what kind of contract it is. If you don't have a driver's license and they pull you over, the first thing you need to say is, I, I don't have a contract. They may still give you the ticket, but understand that if there are other things, which I already explained in the language of silence, which because we are amongst non mores tonight, I will not show you. However, there's a language of silence that you can speak to these people and they will not bother you. You can trust me on that. However, if you are not comfortable and you happen to get off your square and you get the ticket and you have to go to court, that's the first thing you have to say. I don't have a contract. And all of these courts, because they are corporations, the only type of policy they can deal with is contract policy. Not contract law, contract policy. So the first thing you must ask is what? Do we have a contract? And if the answer is no, then I'm here under threat, duress, and coercion. You are violating my rights. It's as simple as that. You have no other reason to be there. Does that make sense? Okay. If the state comes in and says, you're not treating your children right and we want to take them, right? The first thing you have to say is, state, do I have a contract that says I gave my children to you? Did I, at what point produce the contract? Produce the contract. If you send me a bill and understand that if you belong to the corporate board state, you can't make these arguments because you do have a contract which is the birth certificate, which is the marriage license, which a marriage license is your contract, is the woman's contract with the state and the man's contract with the state. It's not a contract between the man and the woman. Never was, never will be. Unless you have a prenuptial agreement or something else, you don't have a marriage contract with the one you think you love. You have a contract with somebody else who, who becomes a third party to your life, always, till you rescind the contract, all right? Because that's not how you get married. Marriage is under all law. All right? And then what you're responsible to do is to place the oath that you take between the two of you on the public record. Where? Where do you place information on the public record? Do you know? With the county. The counties are ancient. They belong to us. They belong to us. Our ancestors named the counties. Our ancestors formed the counties. Our ancestors set up the, the government of the counties, and the counties operate according to common law. Did you all know that? The counties belong to us. So let me, let me write this for you. How many of you think you live in Philadelphia County? For, for those who, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. When, <laughs> Here we go. See that? Do you, do you recognize that there's a difference between the two? There's a difference between Philadelphia County, which our ancestors set up with certain geographical boundaries, and that corporate, nonprofit corporation that calls itself the County of Philadelphia. It is a corporation chartered to conduct business and commerce and trade and all that within the geographical boundary of Philadelphia County. They are two different things. They are two different things. So when you see documents, pay attention because all documents that you get don't have County of Philadelphia on them. And you know the difference between the two because if you get documents from the County of Philadelphia, you know that you're receiving correspondence from a corporation. Do you understand? 
And if you're receiving correspondence from a corporation, the first question you must ask is, do we have a contract? Now, if you receive correspondence from the county, that's common law. You have the responsibility to respond and adhere to that because guess what? You are a part and parcel of that county. Our ancestors set up these, these uh, geographical boundaries for us, all right? Now, likewise, with any other county or city, pay attention to this one little word. It's a very dangerous word. I'm going to tell you. And as I tell people in my class, when that word shows up, you automatic, you're in trouble. The reason is because most of you prior to tonight, you didn't understand that there was a difference in when they use that little word of. But trust me, there's a difference between whether you're dealing with government or corporation. Government or corporation. You have to know the difference. And if you don't know the difference between these things, they're going to have you swinging left and right in the dark and hitting nothing. Okay? I want to explain to you that when you're dealing in contracts, your status in the contract is very important. How do you establish your presence in a contract so that you are protected? Does anybody know how to do that? Because we're confronted with contracts all the time. And when we do not adhere to certain terms and conditions of the contract, which we did not understand from the very beginning, then we're dragged into court to answer for all kinds of claims and allegations on behalf of the corporation. And we don't even understand why we're there. We think for the most part, the majority of us, and prior to tonight, you get a summons to appear in court, I don't care whether that's a civil action or a criminal action. You are on the defensive because you feel that inherently, maybe I have done something that warrants these allegations. Even if you know for a fact that you're innocent. Because the way that corporate system operates, you are not innocent until proven guilty. You are guilty until proven innocent. And the reason is because as, as some of these uh, sovereign pe state sovereignty people would have you believe, um, the, the United States has declared war on the people. We're in a state of martial law. Well, of course you are. If the people have agreed to, to be corporate wards of a state that's a private nonprofit corporation, and the government operates according to sovereignty, and you agree not to be sovereign, then what have you done? To, you've abandoned your government. The only thing the government can do is declare war on you. That's why you walk into a military tribunal when you walk into these courtrooms. That's why they have a military flag, which is a USA flag with the gold fringe, that lets you know you're in a military tribunal. And the reason is because you've agreed not to be sovereign. So the only way they can deal with you is in a military fashion. Y'all understand that? Okay. So how to protect yourself when you're dealing in, the first thing, I'm not going to really get into details of explaining to you how to stand on your square and how to be in court and all that. The first thing you must understand is how to exist in contracts. That, because if you understand how to exist in contracts, that will significantly reduce your ever having to go to court, to the courtroom. Okay, to the courtroom. If you understand how to deal in contracts, because all these corporations do is deal in contracts, and all the courts, courts, these court systems, let me say that, do is deal in contracts. So if you're not familiar with the contracts, and the majority of their contracts are these. Adhesion contracts. Look in the law dictionary and look up the word adhesion. And what you're going to find is that an adhesion contract is a type of contract where there are terms and conditions that are a part of the contract of which you are not aware. And every time you sign a birth certificate, there's a ra the balance of that contract is somewhere. Whenever you sign a for a driver's license, the balance of that contract is somewhere. You don't have it, you've never seen it, but it does exist. And this is why they have the authority to issue you a ticket for all these different things and violations because there's a contract somewhere that you've signed and you have not reserved your rights. So if you don't reserve your rights, your rights are considered waived 
upon signing of the contract, which means that you know, understand, and agree that there's an adhesion going on and you don't care or you otherwise are not aware. They don't care. They've got you to sign. How do you go back now and correct the fact that you signed all these adhesion contracts everywhere all your life you've signed them? I know you have, because I have too. And now's the time for you to get back into your proper person so you can correct those contracts and get out of the ones you don't want to have and the ones you choose to have, you can exist under your own terms and conditions. That's the most important part. That's long before you get to go into court. Because you can go to court all day long, but guess what? Unless you correct the problem, the root of the problem, which is not knowing how to exist in contracts, you'll constantly go to court, and that's a waste of your time. I'm sure you have many more productive things to do than to keep showing up in court, making special appearance and proper persona sui juris, and stating your status for the record, okay? Now, the first thing you need to do is contact, contact. Contact those entities with whom you have a contract and tell them that in no uncertain terms you want to correct or otherwise change or revise the terms and conditions of your contract. You have the right to do that and you must. All right? If you're going to have the contracts, exist in those contracts under your own terms and conditions. Just because somebody hands you an application and that application has pretty little boxes and everything on it. If there's categories up there that don't apply to you, don't fill it out. Add a box that applies to you. And then when, when we take people to the Social Security Administration to get their name corrected on their Social Security card, this is what, this is what happens. There's a section on there for race, okay? Okay, that's just some of them. They may have a few more. I don't remember, okay? Do any of those boxes apply to you not even the one other it does not apply to you so what do you do you are a more tell them who you are if you don't and you put any other category up there, you have signed it and you have made a contract with them and they're going to hold you to that contract and then if you go back and try to change the contract, they'll say, well, they won't tell you in these words. They'll say, well, we can't do that. Well, why can't they do it? It's because you didn't reserve your rights, but guess what? They reserved all of theirs. And they have the right to not change the contract just because you want to. They reserve that right. Now, what you, and the only way you can get out of it is step out of that corporate ward status and deal with them in proper persona su juris, which means in my proper person of my own right, okay, and go back and correct those contracts. That's the first thing you got to do. The Uniform Commercial Code. Whether you're sovereign or whether you're not, you're dealing in commerce. And when you're dealing in commerce, there's an agreement, a uniform agreement in this country, not this nation, this country, that has a standard that protects people in their contracting. Because you have the right to contract. Even in the treaty, you have the right to trade. You have the right to trade being uh, without interference from any other third party. Okay? You have the right to trade under your own terms and conditions. All right? Now, when you waive that right, and they don't tell you that you have waived the right, they're exercising their rights under the Uniform Commercial Code. And you're not. So go and look up the Uniform Commercial Code and look up those sections that apply to reserving your rights. I would tell you what those sections are tonight, but for me to just tell you does not help you. It only helps you if you go look it up and you see it for yourself. Am I right, Fami Arasante? 
because they did that and now they understand how to sign documents not just because I gave some instruction on certain things they've seen the verbiage in those in those books and they've seen how it applies and has how it has been used in the Supreme Court cases and all the treaty law that applies to these things it's much better for you to go find it for yourself so that's why I just give you that right there the other part is this You see, see my favorite word in there? Of. The United States Code of the Laws. The United States Code of the Laws is the code that's used by all of the United States district courts in federal court. This is what they use. So if you go into federal court, you must cite the United States Code that applies to the violations that are made against you. That's all you need to do because they understand treaty and understand I've been there so many times discussing treaty and constitution and all those things like that. And trust me, when I go to court, they put everybody out the courtroom and they post uh, offices at the door on the inside and the outside because they don't want people to hear what I have to say. And then they come up with all these different little reasons and whatever and get me out of there because they don't want me in there because I know too much and, and I will speak. So the United States Code of the Laws has also the different codes and the procedures, the federal rules of civil procedure in there. All of the criminal code, because understand, if there's a, if there's a parking ticket, what they're saying is that we're suing you for a criminal offense. Did you all know that? If there's a speeding ticket, there's, that's a criminal offense. They're suing you in a criminal court. Do you all understand that? They're filing criminal charges against you for something so simple. All right. If you if you agree to pay a tax bill and then you don't pay it, like with the Internal Revenue Service, because understand they're the Internal Revenue Service, they're a private nonprofit corporation. There are 22 of them all around the country, and they compete for your business. They compete. They don't share information, and they collect money on. They're in the business of collecting money on behalf of the United States Treasury. That's their job. Doesn't mean you have to use them, but if you have a contract with them, would you sign your W-4, right? You sign a, a, a 1040 or 1040A or whatever, any of those other forms, you sign them. That's voluntary. Did you know your signature is voluntary? You can fill out the form and don't sign it and send it in. And even if you claim on there that you say you owe them money as long as you don't sign it, you have not, right, entered into a contract. You've given them all the information, but you have not entered into a contract which binds you. Do you understand? If you send the information, you have filed, and that's all that you're required to do. They don't say you're required to sign. They say, please sign. There's a difference. Please sign. Why? Please sign so we can come after you and take everything you got. <laughs> okay. So when you look up the United States Code of the Laws, you're going to find all kinds of things in there because municipalities who have codes and, and, and uh, regulations and all those things and the state statutes and all that, all of them fall up under the jurisdiction of the United States Code of the Laws. Because no municipality, no county, borough, township, city, uh, uh, state can make a law that's outside the boundaries of federal law. They must all adhere to federal law. But if you agree, if they come up with a policy and you agree and enter into a contract to participate and, and be a part of that policy, then when you try to go to the federal court for protection, the federal court, they're not going to tell you in words they'll dismiss the case, but the reason they're dismissing the cases is because somewhere along the line you signed a contract that behind your back has been produced and put into the court record. And what I always tell people to do is to go down to the file room and get a copy of the docket sheet and get a copy of your file of everything that's ever been put on the record concerning you. And then you go back and correct those things and say, produce the contract or take it out the file. You have to file your paperwork, your motion to the court and say that these things were filed in violation of whatever code applies, of whatever UCC paragraph that applies. These things are in violation of UCC dot dot dot, United States Code dot dot dot. You petition the court to have them removed from your record. Do you all understand how simple this is? This is not hard. 
This is not rocket science. This is what it takes is your perseverance to follow through the steps and get this thing done. Because if you don't do it, certainly it's going to remain on your record. And guess what? No matter how long you live, you can always trade. They always go back and trace something on your record back to you. I don't care if you correct your name or anything like that, which I tell people, even when you correct your name, what we have people stop using your social security number as a trade number. <laughs> That's one of the main things you have to do. <laughs> stop using that social security number. The Social Security Administration tells you, do not give your social security number to anyone. And anyone that you choose to give it to, you have the right to demand, one, how they're going to use it. And you have, under certain terms and conditions, to deny them to use it certain ways. For example, if you got something on your credit report, it's our Sante, we helped him resolve those issues. Um, how did they get on there? Did you authorize that credit reporting company to send, to, to receive any information? Do you have a contract with them? Do you have a contract with J.C. Penney, who you applied for the application? Did you tell them, as a part of your contract, that they could check your credit record? Is that part of the contract? The answer is no. If that's not part of the contract, then they violated UCC and the United States Code by contacting that credit reporting bureau to get any information on you. And then the credit reporting bureau has violated UCC and the Code of the Laws to send any information relative to you because you did not explicitly authorize them to do so. So, guess what? They have done damage to you, and then guess what? You have the right to sue for damages, am I right? Okay, so contracts and these courts, that's the only thing you're dealing with, is contracts. Contracts, and never forget that. I'm going to write it down. Because I'm ready to close and open the floor for questions, and I just want to leave you with that word contracts and remember how to exist in contracts. Islam.